of what integrity in public life is all about. In the 54 years of our friendship, I have never known Tom Lambeth to make a decision, personal, career, political, or otherwise, on other than the basis of the public interest. So far as I know, he has never been influenced in his decisions by his own self-interest. And that is what this Tom, lecture, inaugural, Tom Lambeth inaugural lecture is all about, ethics, self-interest, and the public good. Nearly four years ago, when former Agriculture Commissioner Meg Scott Phipps, after admitting in court to an illegal campaign fundraising conspiracy, was convicted, a News & Observer staff writer, Amy Gardner, wrote as follows, quote, There was one bright note to Meg Scott Phipps' conviction Thursday. It was a rarity in the annals of North Carolina politics. No statewide office holder has been convicted of committing a crime while in office, according to political experts contacted after the verdict." End quote. Um, at least one of such experts is here this afternoon, and here is how, there was another who is not here this afternoon, whom I'm going to quote, and here is how they explained their conclusion, which they gave to that reporter. Longtime UNC professor and director of the Institute of Government, John Sanders, is John here? No, I didn't think, I think I saw him. He is. is he, where is he? Okay, John, I'm about to quote you. Um, John Sanders said, quote, trading the exercise of one's official authority for money, whether it's for electoral or personal profit, is about as bad as it gets in a position like that. We have tended to elect people of sufficient honesty and good behavior that they don't get into that kind of trouble, end quote. Farrell Guillory, who I know is here tonight, longtime journalist and now happy for us, the director of UNC's program on Southern politics, media, and public life said, quote, the structure of government and the state's, quote, Protestant rectitude, end quote, have insulated it from wrongdoing, end quote. He went on to explain, quote, the governor of North Carolina is weak. He had no veto power until 1997. Nine other statewide elected officials control huge agencies, including public education, agriculture, the state treasury, and the State Bureau of Investigation. And lawmakers control hundreds of appointments to influential boards and commissions. That structure diffuses power and allows independent agencies to monitor one another. We've not been immune from partisanship, racial divides, more power in the hands of the wealthy than the poor. We're not different from America from, in that standpoint. But the political and civic culture has made the political soil inhospitable to out and out corruption. If anything, Phipps's misdeeds and conviction will improve the chances that North Carolina politicians will continue to behave. It is really sad. It's hurtful to the state's body politic to have something like this happen, particularly with a member of a historic family, but it is more of an aberration than a pattern." End quote. Is it still such an aberration? In the last few months alone, the media have been full of reports of ethical defaults by North Carolina public officials. To be sure, in past years there have been occasional ethical transgressions by lesser office holders, but I cannot remember before this year ethical defaults, defaults by someone as prominent as a House Speaker. Recently, as you know, former Speaker Black was convicted of bribery, sentenced for to five years and three months on federal charges of corruptly accepting things of value and fined $1 million on state charges of bribing a fellow legislator to support his candidacy for speaker and attempting to cover up his doing so. Nor have we heretofore witnessed a sitting district attorney, Mike Nifond in Durham, forced to resign from office. This year, not only that, but his law license was revoked by the state bar for apparently self-benefiting violations of the rules of prosecutorial practice including intentionally withholding evidence favorable to defendants and lying repeatedly about its withholding. And, and the state bar even required him to pay the hearing costs. And on September the 1st, he was cited by Judge Osmond Smith for contempt of court for lying to the judge and sentenced to 24 hours in jail for doing so. I have a whole page here of other examples. I, don't, I think I've made the point in those two, but just recently, as, as a month ago, on September 9th, Rob Christensen had a whole column in the News and Observer which cited approximately 24 people, all of them state officials of one caliber or another, who had in fact gotten into trouble and gotten convicted. So I asked the question, 
what's going on here? While we are used to seeing comparable corruption in other states over the years, and while many other states have had high public officers convicted and sent to jail for bribery or misuse of public funds, I think that John Sanders and Farrell Gallery did seem to have it right. North Carolina has been spared historically from, from such events. But why are we witnessing such problems today, and is it indeed a new phenomenon? Some of these, some, some have suggested that these episodes are evidence of the proposition that North Carolina has lost or is losing its innocence. But I'm not, I'm inclined to agree with John and Farrell and discount such an assertion. I believe that the unethical behavior we are witnessing is not a homegrown phenomenon. Um, just as some North Carolinians used to blame all of our problems on, quote, damn Yankees, end quote, or Yankee agitators, I think that the waves of corruption from elsewhere, and they do exist elsewhere, are ever more insistently beating on our own shores, and certainly not just from, quote, Yankee, end quote, territory. And occasionally, they're overcoming our natural resistance to them. But it's all too easy, comforting and wrong, to blame our defaults on external causes. They undoubtedly result also from choices that the people and leaders of North Carolina have made choices that we intend to produce benefits for North Carolina, but which also contain risks of harm. For example, Terry Sanford used to say that North Carolina needed to get into the mainstream of America's life economically, technologically, and otherwise. And that is certainly what we have increasingly done with the corporations, the high-tech jobs, and the world-class research of which the Research Triangle Park, Park is an emblematic example. And I should point out to you, those of you who don't follow it closely, that that institution, the Research Triangle part, almost alone, moved North Carolina from 49th in per capita income in America to around 30th, a huge jump in only 40 years. But the more North Carolina gets into the nation's mainstream, the more we risk being affected by the downside of that mainstream, too. No one would argue that we shouldn't run the risk, because the benefits for all our people are great indeed, but we need to be conscious of the fact that such choices do entail risks to the culture here in which, we need, in which we all take pride. And what is more important, we must take every possible precaution to strengthen what is so good and beneficial about our culture to enable it to mitigate the risks that arise from within the initiatives calculated to bless us with good. To elaborate that point, before North Carolinians began looking outward to the mainstream of the US as something of a model, we focused our attention and aspirations on our culture and institutions as a state. We therefore consciously developed our friendships, our business relationships, our associations, primarily with other North Carolinians. As we have increasingly looked outward, North Carol beyond North Carolina's borders, developed business and professional relationships and friendships with those in other states and indeed in other countries, aspired to national rather than primarily local opportunities for our careers and lives, traveled often to far off places, fly off to vacations, indeed off many weekends as well, away from North Carolina and North Carolinians. We spend less of our time and energy on building the local networks, the local friendships, and the local associations which were, and still are, the bulwarks of the values that we treasure here in North Carolina. We try to have it both ways, but as Adlai Stevenson, that really does date me, doesn't it, <laughs> used to say, there are no gains without pains, or he might say, there are no benefits without costs. So as North Carolinians look more often to the nation and the world, we cannot expect to remain immune from the pathologies that affect those other places. And we all know of many examples of the corruption that we fear. In fact, the, indeed, international culture, sorry, in fact, the national, indeed, international culture reinforcing ethical behavior is suffering in exactly the same way as we experience in North Carolina, except much worse, because their cultures have even less resistance to its corruption than we have been fortunate to enjoy, have enjoyed for so long in North Carolina. Now I'm skipping several pages to make you all feel a little bit more comfortable. 